Hi, everybody. Brian Kenny here, and welcome as ESPN Classic presents Fighting the Mob, the story of Carmen Basilio. There was definitely no love lost when Carmen Basilio and Sugar Ray Robinson fought each other in the ring. The pugilists had two brutal fights, each winning once. Basilio respected Robinson's in-the-ring ability, but could care less for his antics outside of the ring. He was in love with himself. He was arrogant, a real egotist, and uh, thought that nobody was better than him, and everybody had to get down on their hands and knees for him. I'm a stubborn SOB, too, and I'm not going to get down on my knees, hands and knees for anybody. In 1952, I had just fought uh, Billy Graham on television. I took my way to New York City. We were walking down Broadway. This pink Cadillac pulls up. Sugar Ray Robinson and a group get out, and I said, I want to meet him. I uh, went up and I introduced myself, said I just fought Billy Graham last week on television in Chicago. And he gave me a brush off. I was embarrassed. And I said, someday I'm going to fight that SOB and kick his ass. That was 1952. Well, it took five years. By 1957, I got my chance at him. Both Robinson and Basilio were inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990. Later in the show, we'll get Al Bernstein's take on Basilio. But first, we present Fighting the Mob, the story of Carmen Basilio. Thanks for watching ESPN Classic. The champion from Canastota, New York, Carmen Basilio. Basilio was that good that he had problems. The fight game wasn't always honest. You faked the knockout, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Quit that dirty, rotten game, she said. I think boxing is the swill barrel of sport. Racketeers controls the so-called sport of boxing. Frankie Carbo was a professional hitman. Mr. Gray. Mr. Gray, that's what they called him. He killed many, many people. The underworld commissioner of boxing. I respectfully decline to answer a question on the ground that I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. The mob made life difficult for Carmen because they couldn't control him. They didn't want him to win. The winner and new middleweight champion of the world. He was in a very, very difficult spot. His managers were particularly close to Carbo and to Gabe Genovese. They made me think I was the biggest criminal around. I would never mock you, man. Johnny came to me and he says, I'm going to have to hook up with the mob in order for you to get a championship fight. And I refused to give anything up. They started to refer to Basilio as the man of courage. Carmen Basilio was born and grew up in Canastota, New York. And out of Canastota, New York, there's a, a narrow highway that runs northwest to Oneida Lake. And about four miles out of town, there are what used to be called the mucklands. And uh, they used to go out and pick onions in these mucklands. You know, it's a rich black soil, but in the summer sun, it can burn your hands and burn your feet. And the weather was very temperamental. I mean, you could lose a whole year's crop in a single July afternoon when the hail came, and you could sometimes literally see it coming down the rows uh, in the field. If you were old enough to walk and eat, you had to work. Everybody worked. It was a job for everybody on the farm. And they would live right there and get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Whole families of people, kids and everybody, on their hands and knees, working in onions. We hated it. We were kids. Who wants to work when you're a kid? One day, he said, I finally had it. I had done a little fighting, and I stood up and I said to my pa, Pa, I'm quitting. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a fighter. And he said, you'll take many a beating. And I said, yeah, and I'll give many a beating, too. My father was a boxing nut. He followed all of the fights. I remember we were little kids, and my father was going to go with a couple of his paisans to Syracuse, New York, 
Primo Canero was going to box an exhibition there. We could take those old Italians, and uh, one of the Paisans was champion of the world. That's one of the most thrilling things in the world for them. I think when Primo Canero won the heavyweight championship of the world, it may have been one of the only times that heavyweight championship was uh, fixed. The poor fight game suffered more, I think, from being manipulated by the dark forces, whatever they are, than any other sport. Gamblers and profiteers had long had their hands in boxing, but by the mid-30s, the fight game had been wholly taken over by the underworld. After Prohibition, the mob looked for a new source of revenue. It had controlled boxing pretty thoroughly during Prohibition, but now they needed to go big time. And boxing was a great place to, to start, and it controlled it absolutely thoroughly. The really big time racketeer to enter the boxing game was Oni Madden, who was a prime bootlegger in the uh, 20s. Somehow or another got the uh, contract of uh, Jack Sharkey. They always own a piece of the champion, and own him meant they would get a percentage of his purses, and they could decide who he would fight. And the pattern was you don't let him fight anybody who you don't already have an interest in. If anyone could succeed at swindling prize fighters, it was Paul John Carbo, alias Frank Fortunati, alias Frank Tucker, alias Jimmy the Wop. Frank Carbo was a guy who came up in the Bronx, whose childhood was one petty scam after another, and then he started killing people for a living, linked to uh, Murder Incorporated and all the great mobsters of Brooklyn. His first homicide was a, uh, a case where he was shaking down cab drivers in the Bronx. One cab driver was recalcitrant, and Carbo killed him. Four years, he was in hiding. Then he came back and pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He got a two and a half year sentence. Frankie Carbo earned his stripes in the Vito Genovese crime family, and his status rose quickly. In 1936, Vito rewarded Carbo with a stake in his cousin Gabe's middleweight champion, Babe Briscoe. And Genovese says to him, look, I like you, Frankie. You've been loyal, you've been good. Why don't you say, take 20% of his fighter? So what happened was that within six months, Carbo figured 100% is better than 20%, and Carbo had 100%, and that was his first fighter. From there, he began to get more and more into boxing, and he became the underworld commissioner of boxing. But if you said Carbo to someone in boxing, it would go like this. Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray. Uh, that's what they called him, Mr. Gray. Carmen Basilio knew little of the gray-haired Frankie Carbo. Clean-cut, 21, and fresh out of the Marines, Basilio had one thing on his mind, earning a living. Somebody said to me, you want to make 50 bucks? I said, how do you do that? He said, fight a professional fight in Binghamton, New York. I said, yeah. So I turned pro, went down and had my first pro fight in Binghamton, New York, and I won by a TKO in the third round. After about my third or fourth uh, pro fight, I come home and I had my eye was all black and blue and closed. My mother, she had a fit. You quit that dirty, rotten game, she says. Mary Basilio was more astute than she knew. By the late 1940s, New York District Attorney Frank Hogan had waged war on racketeering. He thought he struck gold the night Jake LaMotta gave up against Billy Fox. LaMotta was a was a wonderful fighter that couldn't get the title shot that he wanted. And the mob came to him and said, look, you play ball with us and you get the shot. At the time, the mob was building up a guy by the name of Billy Fox. Turned out to be not that great of a fighter. Billy Fox had a record of 43 consecutive knockouts, all fixed, I would imagine. So Lamar said, OK, if I get the fight, I'll take the dime. Madame Madame Parker writing said that the sound of, of splashing water was heard in Madison Square Garden last night, you know, as Lamotta took his dive. Here's a guy who knew the difference between right and wrong then, but it didn't influence him very much. Besides the promise of a title shot, Lamotta allegedly received a $100,000 bribe, but District Attorney Hogan had no proof. To the dismay of big-time Broadway bookmakers, Frankie Carbo and other mobsters made a killing on the fight. The scam caused enough of a stink that the New York Boxing Commission fined LaMotta $1,000 and suspended him indefinitely. LaMotta was a street kid. Grew up in Lower East Side, went to the Bronx, 
fended for himself. Basilio, you know, grew up in Kenneslow, New York. He had a family, uh, upbringing, uh, do the right thing, and he didn't have to look towards the mobsters. Carmen Basilio was a man with honor, a man of integrity. I always thought of him as the honest onion farmer. <laughs> Why are we wearing these outfits? I thought we should practice our Irish step dancing to celebrate the St. Patrick's Day season. We're cooking now. Ow! Maybe all we need for St. Patrick's Day is our Guinness. Ouch! All we need is Guinness. Brilliant! Brilliant! Enjoy Guinness Draft responsibly during the St. Patrick's Day season. Wheat Thins has zero grams of trans fat with a nutty, crunchy taste worth diving into.